Are humans causing a mass extinction on the magnitude of the one that killed the dinosaurs? Well, the answer, according to a new analysis, is yes. But they say we still have some time to stop it. Mass extinctions include events in which 75% of the species on the planet disappear within a short time period, usually on the order of a few hundred thousand to a couple million years. That's a short time period. It happened only five times before in the past 540 million years of multicellular life on Earth. The last great extinction, of course, occurred 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were wiped out. At current rates of extinction, the study found, Earth will enter its sixth mass extinction within the next 300 to 2,000 years. That's all. The U.S. economy expanded in January and early February in all parts of the country, but businesses reported that they are under pressure to raise their prices. So look out. When Howard was operated on in 1960, safer and more effective psychiatric treatments were widely available. Nonetheless, Freeman went on performing lobotomies for many more years, only stopping when he was 73. Freeman died not long after he did his last operation. But the idea of using surgery to control behavior was now so seductive that far from dying with him, it gained momentum. During the Cold War, mind control became an active area of research.
brainwashing proved to be a blunt tool, but brain surgery offered a more focused result. In the mid-1960s, a procedure developed by Dr. Jose Delgado took psychosurgery to a whole new level. I was continually thinking about the brain, about the possibility to do research, about the possibility to go inside, in the depth of the brain. Rather than cutting things out of the brain, as Walter Freeman had done, Delgado decided the best thing to do was to insert something into the brain. At Yale, Delgado became fascinated by the idea that electrodes implanted in animals' brains could control aggressive behavior. In the summer of 1964, to perform a truly audacious stunt, he chose not a rat, nor a mouse, but a bull. The owner, he said, well, you can do that with cats and monkeys. You can do that with bulls, can you? I don't know. Let's try. Would you allow me to place electrodes in one of your brain bulls? Sure, do that, no problem. But you will not be able to pacify him. I don't know, maybe not. Let's try. Dr. Delgado really did intend to stop an animal specially bred to be aggressive in its tracks. This footage shows Dr. Delgado in action. We anesthetized the animal. There we implanted electrodes in the head. Well, next day, the bull was in normal. Then the bull was just going around, charging against anybody who could be in the world ring. It's not completely normal. Then I thought, well, I know a little about bullfighting, so I'm going to test this by myself. Delgado leapt into the ring with an extremely dangerous animal, armed with nothing but a remote control. He was betting his life that this would work. The animal was a few feet away. I pushed a button in the radio simulator, and the animal really stopped completely. It was, was frightening, it was a, was a, but it was an experiment. And so, when the experiment was over, the bull was in very good health, and I was in very good health also. So, no problem. Jose Delgado was jubilant and saw the success of his experiment as just the beginning. That took us to another big step. If electrodes implanted in animals are possible, can we implant electrodes in the human brain? To many people, this vision of brain manipulation was not thrilling. It was downright terrifying. It presented a nightmarish future where anyone who threatened the state could be controlled. Far-fetched? Well, in 1970, researchers from Harvard Medical School suggested using psychosurgery on black rioters, while others suggested putting implants into gay men to turn them straight. Ethical approval proved impossible. Funding for brain implant research fizzled out. But the story of implants wasn't over. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City, uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, 
we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. I mean, Richard just uh, gave what could be uh, described as a, a mini version uh, of my remarks in talking about uh, the issues that confront us. But I look out at uh, this audience filled with uh, not only many friends and colleagues, uh, but people who have served in prior administrations. And so there is never a time when the inbox is not full. Um, you know, shortly um, before I started at the State Department, a former Secretary of State uh, called me with this advice, don't try to do too much. And it seemed like a wise admonition, if only it were possible. But the international agenda today is unforgiving. Two wars, conflict in the Middle East, ongoing threats of violent extremism and nuclear proliferation, global recession, climate change, hunger and disease, and a widening gap between the rich and the poor. All of these challenges affect America's security and prosperity, and they all threaten global stability and progress, but they are not reason to despair about the future. The same forces that compound our problems, economic interdependence, open borders, and the speedy movement of information, capital, goods, services, and people are also part of the solution. And with more states facing common challenges, we have the chance and a profound responsibility to exercise American leadership to solve problems in concert with others. That is the heart of America's mission in the world today. Now, some see the rise of other nations and our economic troubles here at home as signs that American power has waned. Others simply don't trust us to lead. They view America as an unaccountable power, too quick to impose its will at the expense of their interests and our principles. But they are wrong. The question is not whether our nation can or should lead, but how it will lead in the 21st century. Rigid ideologies and old formulas don't apply. We need a new mindset about how America will use its power to safeguard our nation, expand shared prosperity, and help more people in more places live up to their God-given potential. full committee hearing on cybersecurity. And um, this comes within our purview on this committee. And it, I mean, not trying to be dramatic about it, when, when, the, when the internet was invented, everybody fell flat in their face. They were so thrilled. And the world began to do business in a different way. Now, both the President Bush's Director of National Intelligence, Mike McConnell, who I greatly respect, and President Obama's Director of National Intelligence, Admiral Blair, who I greatly respect, have labeled cybersecurity perpetrated through the Internet as the number one national hazard of attack on the homeland in West Virginia, uh, on, in West Virginia, in America, or anywhere else. So, I mean, it really, it really almost makes you ask the question, would it have been better if we never invented the Internet and had to use paper and pencil or whatever? And that's a stupid thing to say, but it's, it has genuine consequence because it's on the Internet that these acts of shutting down, you know, they have the television saying that ads every day saying that the uh, De Department of Defense is, is um, attacked three million times a day and it's true. Um, everybody is attacked. Anybody can do it. People say, well, it's China and Russia, but there could be you know, some kid in Latvia uh, doing the same thing. I mean, it's an individual act. It doesn't require a sleeper cell. It doesn't require any uh, you know, ammonia or explosives. It's just an act. And um, 
yet it's an act which can shut this country down, mm -hmm. shut down its electricity system, its banking system, shut down really anything that we have to offer. It is an awesome problem. On the Intelligence Committee, we were taken for a full day to discuss to a, to a undisclosed place in Virginia to discuss this. Um, it is a fearsome, awesome problem, to speak. I mean, obviously, it's broader than that, too. I wonder where this stands with you, what your thoughts are, and what you think we ought to be doing about it. You know that uh, you are being followed. It's very intentional. Combined with um, electromagnetic technologies that uh, uh, can cause you pain, cause you headaches, um, body heating, sleep deprivation, along with most of the victims complaining of hearing the voices of their attackers either in their heads or in their surroundings, specifically in appliances that vibrate in their surroundings. Uh, and it's frequency specific. Uh, only the targeted person can hear it. The people around them uh, in most instances can't. And in most instances, because it is any vibrating appliance, if you try to record it, all you're going to get is the, you know, the, the noise, the background noise from the appliance that's vibrating. And if they're hearing it in your head, we've all been kind of duped into the, the social networking um, phase, too, where especially our younger generation, I mean, they don't have to be tracked. They can be tracked by everything they put on Facebook and Twitter and, and MySpace, you know, which is... You know, for the most part, uh, you know, uh, a tool for, for tracking people as it is. I mean, so many people are putting their pictures, all of their, their birth dates, uh, their information. I mean, it's, it's just amazing.